because I've heard that CBD can kind of undo the effects of the high. And for our questioner, Rachel in San Francisco, who said that she had a lot of paranoia, would it be good for her to have some CBD on hand to sort of undo that high? Absolutely. Have some CBD on hand, but also start with like a ridiculously low dose. Like a puff is like five to 10 milligrams. So start with one milligram. Try that for a couple of days. Then the next day, try next couple of days, try two milligrams with like 30 or 50 or 100 milligrams of CBD. You're not going to get in trouble with these really low doses. You might get a little disappointed because they might not help. But if you're going to make a mistake with a dose, make a mistake that it, you didn't take enough and it didn't do anything. Don't make a mistake that you took too much and you're going to have an anxiety attack. And then slowly work your way up to the right dose. So you mean to do a small amount of THC and a large amount of CBD? Yeah, absolutely, because oh. you won't get in trouble with the CBD. Right. And then you work your way up slowly on the THC until you're at a comfortable level. Right. You can't go wrong doing it that way. That's it, to slowly dosing yourself because everybody's individual, right? Yeah, exactly. I haven't had a single patient take too much and have an anxiety attack because I browbeat them into going really slowly and working their way up. That's the key. There you go, guys. That's the secret. So our next question comes from Alicia Mayer on Twitter. She wants to know about how different methods of ingestion work. So uh, for patients who have had an ileostomy, which is a colon removal, cannabis oil has little effect on pain, but vaping flour seems to give great relief. Is this something to do with absorption rates due to well, having that removal? That's really interesting because that doesn't make any sense because you don't absorb it in your colon. You absorb it in your small intestine your stomach, and then your small intestine. You don't, you're, it's completely, remember, you've got your esophagus, then your stomach, then you've got like 20 feet of small intestine. Mm. By the time it gets to your colon, which is just like four feet long, it's been completely absorbed. So removing your colon wouldn't have any effect whatsoever on absorbing the cannabis. Hmm. So I've actually heard of people that edibles don't have much effect on for whatever reason. You've said this before, there's some methods of ingestion that just don't work on certain people. Right, uh, which is strange, but uh, the the ileostomy would shouldn't shouldn't affect. If you had like a whole removal of your small intestine, that would make sense. But the, the large intestine isn't where you absorb anything. The only thing you absorb in the large intestine is you remove water from what's left, and that's so you make the stool more compact. You don't absorb any nutrients in the in the large intestine. So, but um, to get to the different methods of absorption, um, you know, there's inhaling, which is great because it affects you right away and it's much easier to find the right dose. You take a puff, then if that doesn't work, you take another puff in a few minutes and you could figure out your dose right away. Um, it's not as good for your lungs. So I recommend that people um, vaporize dry flour. I don't love the vape pens because they have chemicals in the cartridges. Mm -hmm. Now the whole Evali lung epidemic that we had a year or two ago was from illegal cartridges, not from legal cartridges. But I still think there's crap in those cartridges. And I think it's much healthier to just vaporize dry flour with a Mighty Ear Packs or one of those machines where you heat up the dry flour. And, and it's much safer than smoking to vaporize the dry flour. Remember that to smoke, you heat it up to 1100 degrees and you just incinerate everything and you get the benzene, the tar, the polycyclic aromatic carbons, and you only have to heat it up to 400 degrees to extract the cannabinoids. It tastes better. It's much easier in your lungs. It's healthier. And it's much more economical because you don't lose 80% of it inside smoke. So if you're going to inhale it, I recommend vaping dry flour. Um, the machine pays itself back because it's so much more economical. Now, the good news is that it gives you immediate relief and it's much easier to figure out your dose because you can just take another puff and then you can stop when you've had enough. The bad news is that it only gives you relief for a couple hours, mm -hmm. whereas taking on the other extreme, an edible, can give you relief for 8 to 12 hours. And a but, tincture as well? Is that about similar time? Well, a tincture is in between. A tincture is under your tongue. So theoretically, it gets absorbed in like half an hour. But a lot of times people absorb some of it under the tongue and then they swallow the rest. And then the rest is absorbed like an edible in like an hour, an hour and a half. But a tincture generally can kick in in like half an hour. And a tincture lasts for like four to six hours. Is it because it goes through the blood vessels in your gums and your tongue rather than into your stomach where it's slower? Absolutely. Think of like people having a heart attack taking nitroglycerin under their tongue. Mm. 
-hmm. The reason they put the nitroglycerin under their tongue is because there's a rich bed of blood vessels or veins actually under your tongue. And it's just an opportunity to absorb medication. Mm -hmm. And it's the exact same thing with the tincture. You put drops under your tongue. There's a rich bed of blood vessels and it gets absorbed directly into your bloodstream. Whereas when you take it orally, when you swallow it, it has to go into your stomach, into your small intestine, get absorbed into your blood. It gets metabolized by your liver and eventually makes it to your brain. It takes like one to two hours. So it's much slower to take an edible than to take a tincture. Right. But that's why it lasts longer? Well, I'm not quite sure why it lasts longer. That's a good question. Oh, um, it's a complex one. I always get to the complex yeah, questions. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's metabolized... To, from delta 9 THC to delta 11 THC, which is a little bit stronger. Mm. And it probably just has a longer half-life. I have to look into that. But uh, delta 11 THC, the metabolic product of the edible cannabis, people say is a little bit stronger and a little bit makes you a little spacier. It is a little bit different, the high from an edible, than the high from smoking. So that's something else to be aware of. Um, it's not that different, but it is a little bit different. And it lasts a lot longer. And this is the good news is that it can give you edibles can give you relief from your pain or whatever is bothering you for longer. The only bad news is that um, if you take the wrong dose, you're stuck with it for longer. Mm -hmm. So if you make the classic rookie mistake of like eating a couple candies and then after half an hour saying this didn't do anything, I'm going to have five more candies. And then two hours later, you're like way too high and you're anxious um, you're stuck with it for like eight to 12 hours because it does, edibles do last a long time. And does CBD help to undo any of that? CBD helps to a certain extent, but if you've really taken too much, you're sort of up a creek. So, I mean, not you're not going to die, but you can have a really miserable experience. Like, it's really not fun. Believe me, been there, done that. It is yeah, not, I mean, we all have. <laughs> Everybody's done it. Yeah. It's just not fun at all. It is absolutely to be avoided. So, Again, if you're going to make a mistake with the dose, especially with edibles, make the mistake that you didn't take enough, you're a little bit disappointed, try again the next day with a slightly higher dose. Don't make the mistake of taking a second edible dose on the same day because you could end up overshooting and that's a very, very uncomfortable experience. Again, the only way to get in trouble with cannabis you know, aside from obviously driving and stuff like that, is by taking too much. If you keep the doses low, you're not going to get into trouble. It's like my mom said, everything in moderation. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to, now that we're talking about THC, Delta 9 and THC 11s <laughs> and all of these letters and numbers, uh, let's move on to a question from Al McDonald, who wants to know uh, what is Delta 8 THC. So we're asking about all of these different cannabinoids, which are basically the substance that the cannabis plant produces. What in the world are all of these letters and numbers mean? And what is THC 8? Okay, well, THC is just the molecule in cannabis that gets people high. And no one really knew that it was Delta 9 THC until we had Delta 11 and Delta 8. So Delta 9 THC is just the THC that's always been in marijuana that gets people high. Mm -hmm. And Delta 9 just refers to where it's got a double bond. Not a big deal. Doesn't really mean anything. Delta 8 is just a different type of THC that's in the cannabis plant in very, very, very trace quantities. Mm -hmm. And the only difference is that the double bond is in like the eighth position in a ring instead of the ninth position. It doesn't, it doesn't even Very matter. Very oh my God. If I drew it out for you, the double bond would be in a different place. Yeah. But as cannabis and hemp are becoming illegal, uh, people are experimenting with and studying the different breakdown products, the different industrial products. And one of the industrial products of processing hemp into CBD is Delta 8 THC. And that's been studied sporadically, very limited study because of the war on drugs, but it's been studied since the 1970s, even earlier. And that is a, T, a type of THC that's becoming very fashionable very quickly, the Delta-8 THC, because it has properties similar to Delta-9 THC, normal THC, in that it gets you high, mm -hmm. but it doesn't get you as high and the quality of the high is devoid of any or 
has very little of the anxiety. So people love it because it can get you high in the sense that you um, feel many of the good effects of THC, but it's without the anxiety. And it's very purported to be very clear headed and unanxious feeling. It also has medical benefits, such as it's an appetite stimulant. Um, they used it in a study of children um, who had very serious chemotherapy regimens, and they didn't have any nausea whatsoever. Wow. This study was done several decades ago. It um, is anti-inflammatory. Um, and again, we're just scratching the surface, but people are very excited about it because um, it's estimated to have about two thirds of the psychoactivity of THC. It doesn't get you as high. So it's thought to be number one, potentially to have medical potential of cannabis without as much of the psychoactivity. So it could have medical effect um, for people who don't want to get high. Number two, for people who do want to get high, it has a high without, um, you have to take a little higher dose, but it has a high without the anxiety. Mm -hmm. And three, it's just, it's a whole nother type of um cannabinoid, uh, a type of THC to explore for the medical uses. So people are very excited about it. And, you know, just like CBD, CBD has a lot of really valid, real and interesting medical potentials. And there's a ton of marketing and enthusiasm that's soaring way above the actual science. So with all these other cannabinoids, exactly the same thing's going to happen. There's some really interesting potential for Delta-8 THC, but at this moment, everybody's starting to claim everything about it. And we're just going to have to see how it shakes out. Wow. I can't wait to see what happens with this. Is there any way for us to access that right now in product form? Easy. You just order it online and it appears like two oh. days later. Is this is legal for any age? To, I mean, is it it's a, hemp, it's a hemp product? Oh, I'm sure it's 21 and above. Yeah, wow. I, I'm sure it's 21 and above. Huh. But you literally uh, go online, you order it, it shows up a couple of days later. Wow. Okay. All right. Hey, I'm it's like a loophole yeah. because uh, they just haven't made the because it's hemp derived. Wow. Okay. Cool. I'm. <laughs> I need to I look hope... into that a little more. You just opened my world, like. Like tenfold. Oh my gosh. I'm going to be broke in no time. I can't do that right now. All right. <laughs> if we don't hear from you uh, for a couple months, we'll know why. Yeah. So. Uh, THC8 happened to me. That's what went down. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. We're on to our last question. Rachel Bravo Bravo on Instagram wants to know about cannabis and RX drug interactions, so prescription drug interactions. She wants to know how informed we should be about our cannabis and drug interactions. Um, and our friend uh, Michael's friend's dad wants to know about cannabis interacting with blood thinner medication. Okay, well, this is a great topic. Um, now, it's a little bit complicated because when you say cannabis, there are like 600 plus chemicals in cannabis. And so we don't know what all the interactions are. And a lot of these chemicals are in very small quantities. So we're mostly interested right now in what does THC and what does CBD interact with. Right. THC has a lot of like hypothetical interactions. They need to be further characterized. Some can raise the drug levels and THC can lower other drug levels. You know, the ones that immediately come to mind are like valproic acid, which is an anti-epileptic, or like Depakote, which is an, another anti-epileptic. But the drug interactions with THC, A, aren't that well characterized, and B, aren't that particularly severe. And I haven't really heard of people getting to major problems with them, but CBD is a different story. Mm -hmm. CBD does actually have some pretty serious drug interactions that people need to be aware of especially now that everybody and anybody is using CBD for everything. Um, CBD interacts or acts exactly the way that grapefruit juice does. It competes for the liver enzymes that degrade many different medications. Hmm. Therefore, if CBD is competing with those liver enzymes, they're not available to degrade the other medications and it raises the level of these other medications. For some medications, it doesn't really matter. You know, when I'm, as a primary care doctor, prescribing, you know, something like an antacid, it doesn't really matter if I'm prescribing 
20 milligrams or 20.5 milligrams. Right. It just, you know, it's sort of an educated guess to prescribe 20 milligrams. But if there are, 